Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharmeen Beg, and I'm part and the lead educator in the education department here at the Aga Khan Museum. I'm very pleased to welcome you this afternoon as we hear from our very own curator, Dr. Michael Chagnon, who will be taking us on a journey exploring the interconnected world of the medieval era and the powerful role Western Africa played within it. Before we begin, and in the spirit of connecting cultures, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the Aga Khan Museum stands, known as Takaranto, and honor the stewardship, past, present, and future of the Huron Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. This past May, Michael joined us at the Aga Khan Museum as curator and has since played a leading role in bringing to life our current special exhibition, Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time. A specialist of painting and the arts of the book of the early modern Persian sphere, he has held curatorial positions at Japan Society New York, LACMA, and the Brooklyn Museum. Dr. Chagnon's substantial teaching experience most recently includes a graduate seminar on critical approaches to Persianate painting at Columbia University, New York. He received his PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University in 2015. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Chagnon to the stage. Thank you, Charmaine, and thank you for coming out tonight, uh, today, on a really beautiful fall day here in Toronto. Um, I am really pleased that you're all here to, uh, I hope, see the exhibition after this talk, or maybe you saw it beforehand, um, and uh, to hear this, uh, this brief 40-minute uh, lecture, on, uh, which I've renamed. I actually gave it a new title, I think, about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> called Travels in Africa Between the Lines of Text and Image. In the early 13th century, the traveler Yakut ibn Abdullah al-Hamawi, a freedman of Greek origin with a voracious appetite for learning and research, completed an encyclopedic geographical work entitled Mu'ajam al-Buldan, the Dictionary of Nations. In a section on the Bilad al-Sudan, the land of the Sudan, or black people, referring to the lands immediately south of the Sahara, Yakut drew attention to a subregion that he called Bilad al-Tibr, the land of gold. It is one of the countries of the Sudan. Pure gold is ascribed to it. It is situated to the south of the Maghreb. Merchants, merchants travel from the Maghrebi trading center of Sijilmasa to a town on the frontiers of the Sudan called Ghana. These merchants wares are salt, bundles of pine wood, blue glass beads, bracelets of red copper, bangles and signet rings of copper, and nothing else. All this is carried by numerous camels in heavy loads. They carry water from the country of the Lamtuna, who are the veiled people, a Berber tribe. They reach Ghana after enormous exertions. They strive with much suffering until they reach the place which separates them from the owners of the gold. When they arrive there, they beat great drums that they've, taken, that they've brought with them and which may be heard from the horizon where these people of the Sudan live. Yakut goes on, it is said that these people of the Sudan dwell in underground hiding places and burrows and that they are naked like animals the practice of covering the body being unknown to them. This is how their manners are reported, though those people never allow a merchant to see them. Yakut then describes the so-called silent trade, a practice of bartering and exchange in which the two parties never actually directly encounter one another. And he concludes, nothing is known about the land beyond these people, and I think that there is no living being there on account of the scorching sun. Yakut's account of the land of gold is based on numerous sources, primarily the now lost 10th century Book of Aziz by Muhallabi, as well as geographies that survive today, like the 10th century Surat al-Ard, The Picture of the Earth by Ibn Hawqal, and the 11th century Kitab al-Masalik wal Mamalik, the Book of Roots and Kingdoms by the Andalusian polymath and minor princeling Abu Obaid Abdullah al-Bakri. I'm sorry, al-Bakri. 
This last work was itself adapted from an earlier, now lost text with the same title by another scholar, al waraq and updated, and updated with the testimony of informants whom al-Bakri met in Spain. Neither Yakut nor al-Bakri ever crossed the Strait of Gibraltar. They never saw the Sahara or the Sudan. Nonetheless, their texts are today considered among the most important early Arabic language sources for Western African history during the medieval period. Al-Bakri's geography is in fact quoted multiple times in the exhibition upstairs, Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time. Originally organized by the Block Museum at Northwestern University and currently on view uh, at, in a redeveloped display upstairs at the Aga Khan Museum through February 2020, Caravans of Gold is the first exhibition to focus on the central role of Africa and of Saharan and Western Africa, I should say, in global commerce and culture during the Middle Ages. In the exhibition, this period, the Middle Ages is bookended uh, by the spread of Islam across Africa beginning in the eighth century and the arrival of European interests on Africa's Western coast at the end of the 15th century. With this focus, the exhibition aims to lay out a very different story than the one that's so commonly told in the West of a monolithic Africa whose history has been shaped in prominent and irrevocable ways by outside forces. In order to reframe perceptions, the exhibition shifts attention to a time before European colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade a time when Western Africa was host to a succession of empires whose vast power and wealth was owing to their control of some of the world's purest gold. And you can see here, now I have a bad tendency of hitting the next slide instead of the pointer, so I apologize if I make this mistake. You can see here uh, sort of a circuit of West African empires between, let's say, the 8th and the 15th century. And you can see just a sort of cutout of that here with the trade routes and the gold fields of Western Africa labeled here. <clears throat> As the exhibition illustrates, the task of telling Western Africa's medieval history relies on material evidence, mostly fragments, that speak to its links to Europe, the Middle East, and even East Asia. It also relies in part on medieval Arabic language sources like Yakuts and Al-Bakris. In fact, no sources in indigenous languages survive before the 17th century. These are written sources, I should say. At times, the material and textual evidence can be paired in ways that help illuminate the story of Western Africa and its central role in the medieval world. It is the promise of such pairings which recur in the exhibition that uh, inspired this lecture. Because I'm trained as an Islamicist and not an Africanist, when I, was given, uh, when I was invited to give a lunchtime lecture on caravans of gold, my mind immediately turned to the Arabic accounts as my point of departure. My hope was to locate a set of evocative statements like that of al garnati in the 12th century, who describes the movement of caravans through the Sahara toward the Western Sudan in a quotation that opens the exhibition high up on the wall. When you go upstairs, you'll see it. They travel along the sands like seas, led by guides who direct themselves over the wastes according to the stars. My hope was to pair such statements with objects in the exhibition, creating an illustrated and annotated voyage through distant lands in the past. But as I delved more deeply into the texts, their limitations became apparent. For example, the Arabic historiography of the 9th through 15th centuries, in many ways, is cumulative in nature with later authors often relying on, or even repeating verbatim, the information that's provided in earlier sources, even if the information is outdated. Yakut's text is one such example. Having studied and adapted 10th and 11th century sources, by the time of his writing, circa 1220, the quote, great city of Ghana, had actually already been in decline for over a century. And within less than a generation, it would be swallowed by its successor state, the Mali Empire. Sometimes the language of the sources is difficult or even impossible to interpret. 
as is the case with specialized terminology used for certain materials. For example, al-Bakri writes that the inhabitants of one town of the western Sudan called Sila, which is probably located in present day, uh, on the more uh, present day border between Senegal and Mauritania, he writes, quote, used as, uh, they used as currency sorghum, salt, copper rings, and lengths of fine cotton, which they called shakyat. Today, linguists and material historians aren't quite sure what shakyat specifically refer to, though it could be cotton that is indigo dyed, like these uh, textiles that we have on view in the exhibition, the so-called telem textiles, textiles that were uh, found in the Bandiagara escarpment in Mali, and that date between the 10th and 14th centuries, uh, making them amongst the earliest textiles to be found on the African continent. More difficult still is when place names are indecipherable or cannot be identified with locations on period maps, much less known archaeological sites. Once again, al-Bakri, in the same passage, refers to a town that he spells ta ra nun kaf tamarmuta. It is there that shakiat is made, he says. As far as I can tell, however, no such site exists in the cartographic or epigraphic record. Incidentally, however, we learn from a later 12th century anonymous source quoting al-Bakri that a town next to Sila called Kalambu also, or perhaps instead, uses shakiat as currency. This demonstrates the cumulative and somewhat contradictory nature of the historiography. There are many other kinds of problems like this that art historians and historians in general are all too familiar with. This is a long way of saying that my admittedly premature ambition to take you on a journey has, like many journeys, been made rather more complicated by forces beyond our control. However, one final issue, particularly for a project that seeks to pair texts with artifacts, is that while sources frequently mention material culture, such items are often presented as lists or litanies with little insight into the provenance or use of such items. Recall, for example, that Yakut names imports into the Sudan as blue glass beads, copper bracelets, bangles, signet rings, and so forth. Worse still, the sources seem to be entirely, seem to be, I should say, emphasize that, entirely silent about whole classes of objects that survive today and are shown in the exhibition upstairs, uh, but aren't mentioned in the text, as I mentioned. This is something that I'll touch on at the end of the lecture. In short, the historical record is often spotty and difficult to interpret, and yet at the same time unwieldy. So for the remaining half hour, I'd like to help navigate, if not rectify, some of these issues by examining a selection of texts and images as case studies. And I'm gonna stop here and just say, this is not a very heavily illustrated lecture. There will be uh, pictures that I'll show along the way, but because of the issues that I've just laid out, um, I have maybe about 20 more slides, so it's not gonna be lavishly illustrated. But I do, I am gonna quote texts at length. I'll try to have them up on the slides so you can read them. Um, but if, you, if I mention something and it's not up on the slide, just close your eyes, imagine that you're somewhere else and enjoy. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start out by uh, examining a selection of texts and uh, places, uh, I'm sorry, as, and images as case studies. And then I'm going to look at a period map to shed some, uh, shed some light on the places and people that the sources mention. I'll then connect a few sites depicted on the map to object types that appear to have captured the imagination of our medieval Arabic writers and which relate to works shown in the exhibition. I'll also talk about some objects that captured my imagination. These are mentioned in the Arabic accounts, but they don't survive. And lastly, I'll end with some tentative ideas about not just absent objects, but about how extant objects can be viewed in light of what lies between the lines of our texts to consider people who are absent, absent in space-time, as well as from the historical record. In 1154, the scholar Abu Abdullah Muhammad al-Sharif al idrisi a descendant of the Banu Hamoud dynasty of Malaga, most likely a native of Morocco, completed a commission by the Norman king of Sicily, Roger II, 
of a world geography accompanied by maps of the 10 sections at Jizah of each of the seven climbs, Akalim. To open his manuscript, Idrisi created a world map, best known to us today from a strikingly wrought version found in a 16th century Kyrene manuscript. The Idrisi map presents a vision of the world that medieval Muslim scholars would have been equally familiar with as we are today with the Mercator projection. Here, Mecca lies at the center of the world. Oops, see, I told you. There we go. Mecca lies at the center of the world. North is presented at the bottom. Here's Europe, Italy, upside down boot. And south is at the top. Does that make sense? Can you all see it? Okay, good. Wrapping around the south and the west is the great landmass of the African continent. There's a clear division in Idrisi's map of eastern and western Africa, probably reflecting earlier traditions repeated throughout the Masalik Wamamalik literature. This is the, the roots and kingdoms literature, geographical literature, that the nations of the Sudan were descended from some of the sons of Nuh or Noah some of whom settled in the east and some who settled in the west. And so this division you can really see here. It's sort of east, you hear the boom, 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 boom. And then you have West Africa over here. The East African nations are relatively easy to pair with sites, either imagined or known today. Wakwak, a mythical island where people grow on trees, is here well-known in the literature. Alexander is said to have gone to the edges of the earth and encountered the wakwak -wak tree, where maidens grew on, on uh, trees, and if you pluck them, they scream, actually. Sofala is the next. Sofala is a port town that we know uh, is uh, in what is present-day southern Mozambique, which was highly active through the modern period. Zanj is the next. Zanj correlates to Zanzibar off the coast of Tanzania, uh, and the Zanjis are frequently mentioned in fantastical literature and myths of the Islamic world. Um, frequently they're uh, sort of barbaric peoples that are fought with. And Barbara, which correlates to the port of Berbera in Somalia today, and then Al Habasha, which is Abyssinia or Ethiopia, you can see Nuba here, which is Nubia in the present-day nation of Sudan. You can see that Idrisi follows earlier geographies by placing the source of the Nile here in this set of mountains, which he calls, uh, and which is called in the literature, Jabal al the moon, the mountains of the moon. And you'll also see that the Nile, which flows down to Mesr, which is Egypt, uh, it branches off into another direction. It actually has two branches, the Egyptian branch and then this westerly branch, um, which represents manifold misunderstandings of how the great river systems of West Africa, particularly the Niger and Senegal rivers, relate to the rest of the continent's geography. Nonetheless, it's in the northern and western portion of Africa where we see the, the, the west branch of Noah's sons. And we can see here, so here's Nubia, Tajwin, uh, Tajwin, which is Taju or Daju, which is uh, the Daju kingdom that ruled in Darfur during, uh, through the 15th century. We have Kanem, which is, uh, I'm sorry, here's Tajwin. Oh yeah, so Kawar is here. So Kawar refers to the Kawar escarpment in northeast, northeastern Niger. We have Kanem, which is a great empire that ruled around Lake Chad um, through the 15th century. Again, I'll talk about Kanem a little bit later. Kaukau, which is Gao. If, uh, who's been to the exhibition, if you want to raise your hands? There is in that big archaeological fragments case at the very start a, a set of material from the site of Gao. It's actually a, an actual place that has been dug up and we have archaeological finds from. Uh, it's a site that was located, that is located in present-day Mali uh, and was its own uh, very powerful kingdom 
uh, between the 9th and the 15th century uh, and became the center of the Songhai Empire. We also have, uh, in this band to the north, we have the uh, oases. We have Fezzan, which is the southwestern uh, region of Libya. We have Sanhaja, so Lamta and Sanhaja, which are the Berber nations here. Bilad al Ghana, here's Ghana, north of the Senegal River, perhaps. Um, we have, uh, so the Ghana Empire will be very important in the rest of the lecture from about 700 to the year 1230 or so when it was absorbed by the Mali Empire. It was uh, sort of the, uh, the lodestar of the Sudan for Arabic writers. Uh, we have Maksara below the south of there. Uh, Maksara refers to uh, Sila, which I mentioned earlier, which is in Senegal. And then Lam Lam. Was a site whose uh, inhabitants are often referred to as they were. They, they write they were Jews, but they've fallen into disbelief, and they are depicted as barbaric. Um, I have a whole paper about Lam Lam someday that I will write. Interestingly, the land south of Kanem in the Lake Chad region in the central Sudan. This is again. Oops. Oops. Keep doing that here. And the south of the land of the Lam Lam in Western Sudan are empty, as you can see, represented on the map as a vast wasteland. This recalls what Yakut said about the land beyond the people of the Sudan. Quote, nothing is known about it, and I think there is no living being there on account of the scorching sun. The caption on Idrisi's map corroborates this idea, reading Sahawa Ramale Khilfe wa Ard, the wastes, literally the, dan the, the deserts and the sands behind the equator. Clearly, very little was known about these lands, imagined as deserts. Looking at a satellite image today, we can see that the area is just south of the Sahel, which is uh, the Arabic word for the coast, which is that grassland between the desert and the not-so-desert. So just south of the Sahel, where the geographer's knowledge of the land ends, is not a desert, but a lush forest. Almost as a rule, though, the information that the Arabic texts provide become increasingly more detailed in correlation to the proximity, to, uh, the proximity of these lands to the Sahara and ultimately the Mediterranean. In other words, the farther north you go, the more information there is. And so you can see there's a concentration of sites and geographic elements in this world map, uh, starting with Barnak, which is Benghazi, which you may have heard of. Um, I can't read that one because I don't have my glasses. Uh, uh, oh, that's Jarid. Jarid is in uh, Tunisia. This is Ifriqiya, which is Tunisia. Uh, we have the farthest Maghreb. We have um, uh, Tanja, Tangiers here. We have Al Sous, which is the central portion of uh, Morocco, let's say right around here, uh, and so forth. I do want to start here, though. Just on the other side of the mountains from Sous is Lamta and Sanhaja. These are the Berber areas. So we can turn to material culture now, uh, in which the medieval Arabic sources tend to focus on goods and wares of certain kinds. They are sort of replete with information about clothing, items of trade, and items of war, foremost. One particular form of armor, namely the shields associated with the Lamta Berbers of the Maghreb, appears to have captured various authors' imaginations, since they return, time and again, the sources return, to these amazing objects in their descriptions. A comparative reading reveals an attitude toward materiality that recurs throughout medieval Islamic thought, and I would say medieval thought more generally. The descriptions of Lamtia shields begin with the late 19th century Kitab al-Buldan of uh, Ahmed al-Yaqubi who would go on to be a main source for writers until al-Bakri in the 11th century. Al-Yaqubi writes, between Zawila and the town of Kawar live people called Lamta who greatly resemble Berbers. They produce white leather shields called Lamtia. 
One of Yaqubi's followers, Ibn al-Faqih, writing in the early 10th century, elaborates, quote, Inhabitants of the desert wastes and the Lamta have shields of hide, which they soak in milk for a whole year. The sword rebounds when it strikes it, and if it should cut into the shield, it sticks in and cannot be pulled out. The Lamtia shields are unique, unquote. Ibn al-Faqih thus imparts a near imperviousness to the shield and intimates a nearly active living quality in its ability to absorb a sword, possibly owing to its metaphorical gestation in a milk bath for a year. Such quasi-magical properties that Ibn al-Faqih attributes to the Lamtia shield are advanced by later authors. Al-Bakri, again in the late eight, uh, 11th century, tells us that the best and most expensive Lamtia shields are made from the hides of specifically old female oryxes, whose horns, this is a quadruped that provides the leather, whose horns, he writes, are so long that male oryxes can no longer mount them. Perhaps the suggestion here is that their hides remain unblemished by mating activity. Or perhaps al-Bakri hints at the idea that the hides magically retain a portion of the old female oryx's ability to repel penetration. Az-Zuhri, writing in the late 12th century, states, quote, that these shields are most amazing because if they're struck by lance, sword, or arrow and are pierced, but are left a short while and then examined, it's found that no mark remains, but all have become as sound as they were previously." Al-Qarnati, whose mid to late 12th century text Tuhfat al-Albab, The Gift of the Spirit, elaborates ethnographic information with fantasy taken from the wonders of creation, the Ajab al-Makhlukat genre. And he writes, the shields are three cubits long, light and pliable, and cannot be pierced by an arrow, nor does a sword make any impression on them. They are white like paper and cover the warrior and his horse. A century later, in the 1270s, the great Ajaibist, to coin a term, the great fantast fantasticalist, to, uh, adds, uh, this is um, Al-Qazvini, adds to the invincibility attributed to these shields by Az-Zuhri with a magical near self-healing. Quote, the skin is tanned with milk and the shell of ostrich eggs for a whole year. Iron makes absolutely no impression on it. If it is struck by swords, the swords glance off. If it should happen to suffer a scratch or a cut, it's damped with water and rubbed with the hand and the mark disappears. Shields and cuirasses are made from this leather and they're worth 300 or in other manuscripts, three, uh, 30 uh, dinars a piece. Idrisi, who provided our map that we looked at earlier, summarizes, quote, no shields are so extraordinary. Lamtia shields, as we know from the caravans exhibition and catalog, were illustrated in medieval manuscripts as, one, uh, as in one of the Escorial Library codices of the Cantigas de Santa Maria of the last quarter of the 13th century, here being held by Berber soldiers. Nevertheless, despite the near total inviability ascribed to these objects, alas, no medieval era Lamtia shields actually survive today. What do remain, however, are white leather shields, such as this one of the Berber Tuareg of the Sahara, such as an example on, uh, in the show that it dates to the late 19th century. Aside from its form, which closely conforms to both the medieval Arabic descriptions and the medieval Spanish illustration, it seems that the ideas of impermeability and self-healing have also been retained by the Tuareg. Close examination of the shield reveals uh, an ornamental scoring of the surface to create a raised cruciform motif beneath the applique cloth and leather and metal. With the play of light and shallow, the shadow that these scorings uh, create, the surface markings closely resemble scars that have healed on the skin. So much of the exhibition, Caravans of Gold, deals with the impact of West African gold upon the world's economic and cultural heartbeats during the medieval period. And yet the amount of gold in the exhibition, vis-a-vis -vis works in other media, is limited. Of course, not only were medieval gold objects continually melted down and reused, 
Some of them, like filigree jewelry, are so delicate that the fact that any of it survives from a thousand years ago or so almost defies belief. One example is the small filigree bead from the Aga Khan Museum collection ascribed to Fatima to Egypt in the 10th or 11th century. Unlike the material record, however, medieval Arabic texts are full of references to gold when describing West Africa. From the earliest writings in the 9th century, part of the, uh, parts of West Africa as, are described as being literally fertile with gold, as though the metal were an organic substance. Ibn al-Faqih writes that in the country of Ghana, quote, gold grows in the sands like carrots, and it is plucked at sunrise. Okay. This is repeated more or less verbatim by no less eminent a source than the great Iranian scholar and polymath al-Biruni a century later. An entire course could be taught on the Arabic sources on gold, and many such citations find their way into the exhibition and catalog. I'm going to keep telling you to go upstairs and buying the catalog, you know, it's, uh, that's why I'm here. So for the sake of time, let me focus on a few passages which strike me. There we go. <clears throat> Al-Bakri, once again, writing in the 11th century, describes the wealthy and bustling oasis town of Audagost on the southern edge of the Sahara in what is today southern Mauritania, in typical language for the medieval Arabic sources. And just to show you, Algadost is here. Um, Ghana, the city of Ghana, is associated with this site, Kumbi Saleh, so that just gives you uh, a sense of proximity to Ghana. About Agodost, he writes, it is a large, populous town built on sandy ground, overlooked by a big mountain, completely barren and devoid of vegetation. There is one Friday mosque and many smaller ones. In the mosque, there are teachers of the Quran. Around the town are gardens with date palms. Wheat is grown there by digging with hose, and it is watered with buckets. Excellent cucumbers grow there, and there are a few small fig trees and some vines, as well as plantations of henna, which produce a large crop. Cucumbers are important, and so on. Algadus produces wells with sweet water. Cattle and sheep are numerous. Honey is abundant, brought from the land of the Sudan. The people of Algadust enjoy extensive benefits and huge wealth. The market there is at all times full of people, so that owing to the great crowd and the noises of the voices, it's almost impossible to hear the words of one sitting next to you. The transactions that they make are in gold, and they have no silver. There are handsome buildings and fine houses. Most of the inhabitants are natives of Tunisia, but there are also a few people from other countries. They own slaves so numerous that one person from among them might possess a thousand servants or more. Al-Bakri goes on to describe various luxury goods imported to and exported from al -Gadost. The animals whose hides shields are made from, here we go again with the shields, this animal is very common in al -Gadost. Objects of worked copper and amply cut robes, dyed red or blue, are sent to al -Gadost. And from there, uh, are natural ambergris of excellent quality uh, and, there, and from there, natural ambergris of excellent quality is exported. For the Atlantic is not uh, far away, so they export it along the sea. Also, pure gold worked into twisted threads. The gold of Aldegost is better and purer than, any, than that of any other people on earth. Unquote. What this passage suggests then is that gold chain or possibly wire or even filigree was produced in Aldegost and exported to regions beyond. This passage may shed some, light, said, shed some light on shared tastes in personal adornment stretching from the southwesternmost point of the Sahara to Egypt and beyond. This shared taste for gold jewelry is also apparent in another medieval Arabic text, nearly contemporaneous with that of al-Bakri writing in the mid to late 11th century. It's composed by the jurist and biographer Abu Bakr Abdullah al-Maliki. Writing from Kairawan, north of the Sahara in Ifriqiya, up here, he, uh, he relates the following about a certain goldsmith named Sakhan. Quote, he says, Sakhan said, quote, I used to make copper chains and wash them in gold as is done with bridles and send them to be sold in the land of the Sudan. Uh, 
I had scruples about them, so I asked various jurists about it. Karawan, by the way, was a great learning center and a great center of Maliki juridical thought, so there was probably plenty of scholars you couldn't reach out to. One asked me in turn, are these people to whom you send these change muahidun, are they allies? And I said, yes. And he replied, I don't think it's right, it's fraud. This text provides a fascinating insight into the law and ethics of trade in gold jewelry in the staunchly Maliki juridical environment of North Africa. But it also said, sheds light, uh, some light on the material culture in this era, including the practice of creating gilt rather than gold jewelry. Here, copper is washed uh, or plated in gold. Uh, this recalls later production of biconical beads in regions to the south, similar in form to the Fatimid example in the Aga Khan Museum collection on the left, uh, but made of gilt me metal rather than pure gold. On view in the exhibition, for example, is this object from the Detroit Institute of Art on the right, uh, a 19th century example from Senegal made of gilt silver. Based on al-Maliki's writing, however, such costume jewelry would have already been known across North and West Africa into the Western Sudan already by the 11th century. Of course, the central node in the gold trade between the gold fields of West Africa and the Western Sudan and Sahara, at least in the early Middle Ages, was Ghana, with its capital believed to be located at the present day site of Kumbi Saleh. No, ah, good, as I mentioned. Uh, this Kumbi Saleh is a site that's in uh, southeastern Mauritania. I say believed because despite the empire's power and near ubiquity in the early medieval Arabic language sources until the 13th century, its actual location remains, the the, um, to say the capital of Ghana, uh, remains specul speculative. No evidence corroborates the theory linking Kumbi Saleh to Ghana. Nonetheless, numerous textual descriptions remain. Al-Bakri writes, quote, do I have a quote? Nope, oops, shoot, I gave away the joke. Nonetheless, numerous textual descriptions remain. Al-Bakri writes, it's made of two towns situated on a large plain. One of these towns, which is inhabited by Muslims, is large and possesses 12 mosques, one of which is a Friday mosque. There are salaried imams and muezzins, as well as jurists and scholars. And I'm just gonna take a side note. Az-Zuhri repeats this last claim in the 12th century writing, that today the townsfolk of Ghana are Muslims and have scholars, lawyers, and Quran readers, and they have become preeminent in these fields. Uh, this all suggests, speaking of missing objects, this all suggests that in West Africa there must have been great libraries. And I wonder where, I wonder what these books are. Anyhow, the second town of the two towns, Al-Bakri goes on, is, quote, the king's town, six miles distant from the Muslim town, and it bears the name Al-Qaba. Between these two towns are continuous habitations. The houses of the inhabitants are stone and, ac and acacia wood. The king has a palace and a number of domed dwellings, all surrounded with an enclosure like a city wall. Around the king's town are domed buildings and groves and thickets where the sorcerers of the people, men in charge of the religious cult, live. In them too are the idols and the tombs of their kings. Among the people who follow the king's religion, only he and his heir apparent might, may wear sewn clothes. All other people wear robes of cotton, silk, or brocade, according to their means. All of them shave their beards and women shave their heads. The king adorns himself like a woman, wearing necklaces around his neck and bracelets on his forearms. And on his, uh, and a high, uh, on his head, a high cap decorated with gold and wrapped in a turban of fine cotton. When dispensing justice, he sits in a domed pavilion around which stand 10 horses covered with gold embroidered materials. Behind the king stand 10 pages holding shields and swords decorated with gold. At the door of the pavilion are dogs of excellent pedigree who hardly ever leave the place where the king is guarding him. Round their necks, they wear collars of gold and silver studded with number of balls in the same metal. You're welcome. 
Al-Bakri's descriptions of Ghana's capital and court culture, including its material culture, would be repeated in later times, not only by Az-Zuhri, but also others who sometimes update and or contradict what he says. For example, Ali Drisi, who developed the map shown at the beginning of this lecture, writes less than a century after Al-Bakri the following, quote, Ghana consists of two towns on both banks of a river. This is the greatest town in the Sudan with respect to area the most populous, and uh, with the most extensive trade. Here we go. Prosperous merchants go there from the surrounding countries and the other countries of the Maghrib. Its people are Muslim, and its king is said to belong to the progeny of Salih ibn Ab uh, Abdullah ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Hassan Hassan ibn Ali ibn Ali, Abi Talib. So he is descended from the Prophet. The khutbah is said in his name, though he pays allegiance to the Abbasid Caliph. He has a palace on the banks of the river, strongly built and perfectly fortified. His living quarters are, decoration, are decorated, I should say, with various drawings and paintings and provided with glass windows. The palace was built in the year 510, which corresponds to 1116 or 17. A lost Muslim palace with paintings and drawings on the wall in sub-Saharan Africa. This is something that for me as a historian of Islamic painting is utterly fascinating. But beyond the ways that this description ignites our collective imagination, at least mine, and our longing, reading between the lines, it seems noteworthy that Idrisi prefaces his description of the Ghana emperor's palace with his allegiance to the Abbasid Caliph, whose own palace in Samara in Iraq, dated to the 9th century, was of course decorated with glass windows and paintings as well. Whatever the validity of the description of the Ghana palace, Idrisi conveys, uh, what Idrisi conveys uh, may be, I'm sorry, what Idrisi may be signaling is that the patron's architectural and material world associated him with a broader princely culture of the era modeled after the Abbasid court not only in Africa, but as known in other regions, especially regions at the edges of the Islamic world, like the Caucasus or Sicily, with their own sociocultural syntheses that often elude our present day categories of cultural representation. It should be noted that a perhaps similar situation pertained in the central Sudan kingdom of Kanem-Bornu, which came into prominence just about the time that the, the Ghana palace was being built. Here's Kanemboru, and Ghana's over there. By the mid 14th century, Kanem was among, among the most powerful kingdoms on the African continent. Al Omari writes in the 14th century that Kanem's king is, quote, veiled from his people. None sees him save at, uh, at the two festivals when he is seen at dawn and in the morning. I'm sorry, at dawn and in the afternoon. During the rest of the year, nobody, not even the commander in chief, speaks to him." Unquote. Around the same time, the intrepid traveler Ibn Battuta corroborates this information. Quote, the people of Bornu are Muslims, having a king named Idris, who does not appear to the people and does not address them except from behind a curtain. Unquote. In the Caravans of Gold catalog, the scholar Detlef Gronenborn describes this practice of not speaking to your subordinates and seating behind a, a curtain, although this whole week I've been locked in my office, so I, you know, anyway, it seems normal to me. He describes this practice as peculiar. However, like the painted and glazed palace of the Ghana king, perhaps what these accounts signal is a participation within a Muslim courtly practice known from the classical cl caliphal era, and even before, in which the ruler was veiled and unveiled in dramatic ceremonial fashion. Eva Hoffman writes, quote, curtains had symbolic as well as practical functions. The ruler was kept aloof from his subjects, and this ideal was expressed tangibly through the presence of a curtain placed between them, placed between them. Such curtains concealed the thrones of the Umayyad, Abbasid, and Fatimid caliphs. On certain occasions, the curtain was used as a means of attaining dramatic uh, surprise. The caliph, dressed in his regalia, made a sudden appearance as the curtain was drawn. The visitor was devastated by this splendor. I like it when an art historian can write, you know? It's good times. I'd like to end where we begin, where we began today, with Yakut's description of the lands south of the Bilad Tibr, the land of gold. Quote, he said, nothing is known about the land beyond these people 
and I think that there is no living being there on account of the scorching sun. As I mentioned, the scorched wastes that Yakut appears to believe exist, existed in equatorial Africa is given visual form in Idrisi's map. Again, you can see that there's really nothing south of Senegal, present-day Senegal, and this, these so-called Lam Lam. It's just nothing there. This misconception was something that has nagged me, uh, for very clearly, as the exhibition shows, the great kingdoms of the forest region south of the Sahel were active, vibrant, and participated in broader networks of exchange that linked them to the Sahara and well beyond. We have a, hand, a number of very large bronze sculpture on view, copper and bronze sculpture on view upstairs, including some of the greatest masterpieces of uh, Nigerian art. Um, when you crack open a textbook of African art, you see these two things. These are incredibly important figures. And, uh, the seated figure on the right was found at a location called Tada, which is about 200 kilometers north of where it was presumably made in Ife in southwestern Nigeria. It was uh, found in a ritual context. Uh, people uh, in Tada would take the figure down to the riverbank and wash it in the gravel of the river. And then as the gravel collected inside the figure, there's various holes, they would bring that back to its, uh, its place and, let the, and spread the gravel on the ground. And they thought that this would provide uh, abundance, ensure abundance in the fishing uh, of the river. So it's, this is a very important, uh, aside from its ritual use, just an absolutely gorgeous example of 13th, late 13th century sculpture. Um, from anywhere in the world. This misconception, as I said, was something that has nagged me because very clearly the forest region was uh, south of the Sahel was active, vibrant, and participated in broader networks of exchange. What I mean by that is uh, isometric testing of the copper of the seated figure has suggested that the copper uh, may have been sourced in the French Alps. So at the same time that materials like gold and ivory were making their way across the Sahara, across North Africa, across the Mediterranean into Europe to be used to create some of the great masterpieces of medieval European sculpture, European copper is making its way across the Mediterranean, across North Africa, across the Sahara, into the forest regions of, uh, of Africa, of West Africa. Was there really nothing in the Arabic language sources about these vibrant kingdoms? Could our authors actually be ignorant of entrepôts of trade that existed beyond the far reaches of the Islamic world, but were yet seemingly interconnected with them? Maybe. But then again, maybe we haven't read between the lines of texts and images closely enough. I'll end with just one example. In the 14th century, Alumari relates the following story of a shipwreck somewhere off the west coast of Africa. And here, I have to read from the book because I didn't have time to type it up. I've been doing a lot of reading, as you can see. <clears throat> he writes about a sheikh and imam named Abdul, Abu Abdullah Mohammed al-Saig. Uh, this al-Saig informed me that the wazir, Abu Abdullah Mohammed uh, ibn Rag, Raganuh, a reliable man from among the learned jurists of his town of Almeria in Spain said to him, quote, I embarked in a ship on a commercial venture with a company of merchants and we went out through uh, Al Ablaya, uh, the Al Ablaya Strait, which is the entrance to the ocean, making for a certain place in Morocco. But the winds played with us and the waves crashed together so that we, we went beyond the place we were making, that we went beyond the place we were making for. This state of affairs continued so long that we were no longer able to anchor, and so continued to penetrate into the ocean wastes to the south. We were uh, propelled into an overspreading darkness, such that if a man extended his hand into it, he could hardly see it. We'd given ourselves up for lost, as we'd been drawn into the darkness, but then the wind suddenly died down by God's mercy, and we put the ship about and set her on a course for the land. At last we reached the land and anchored and left the ship to seek deliverance. We saw signs indicating the proximity of a city. 
So we made for it and found it inhabited by a population of Sudan, meaning black people. When they saw that we were white, they were amazed and made certain that we had colored our, and made certain, or they were certain, that we had colored our bodies with whitewash. So they rubbed our bodies with palm fiber, and when it became plain to, to them that our whiteness was natural, they were all the more astonished and talked with one another about it. We stayed with them and found that they lived mostly on flesh of snakes and serpents, which are very numerous in their country. They hunt them and eat their flesh. There's no vegetation or pasture in their country. We remained with them for a time until some of them set out for a neighboring country on some business or other, and we went with them. And so we moved on from place to place until eventually we reached Morocco. As uh, as Saig suggests, uh, the indigenous people that greeted the shipwrecked party of Arabs by rubbing them with palm fronds to wipe what they thought was white makeup off their bodies, uh, he, he suggests this is the reason they did this, but perhaps this is a case of an act lost in translation. Palm fronds have immense purifying value in traditional Igbo society. This is in southern Nigeria, exactly from the regions where these sculptures are from. As one writer out online writes, Ofo is made from a sacred palm tree and it is a critical ritual symbol among the Igbo. It is not to be messed with. It is used in traditional religion, blessings and prayers, petitioning, settling disputes and healing illnesses. Might Asai and his party made their way to an Igbo site in southern Nigeria, the same regions that gave us some of the most important works in this exhibition? Was this a ritual rather than an attempt, of an, uh, an attempt at an impulsive act of astonishment and disbelief? And how can reading between the lines in this way amplify our understanding of the significance of these objects to a broader story of the global culture during the Middle Ages? Perhaps it's time to pick up these medieval journeys once again and explore, explore new ways of seeing and reading in the future. Thank you. <laughs>